Welcome to the Cybertron session. Currently, assistive devices such as wheelchairs, prosthesis or exoskeletons are not that well accepted. Wheelchairs have problems to overcome uneven terrain. Lower limb prosthesis have difficulties to climb stairs because the gait becomes more exhausting and asymmetric, which is not the best from a physiological point of view. Arm prosthesis are often too complicated to use or there are problems in the socket stump connection so that they often are ending up in the drawer and not being used by the persons who want to use it. We have to do a lot to improve the communication between the developers and the people with disabilities. We need to focus on better user-centered user -centered design of such kind of assistive technologies. That's why I had the idea already eight years ago to organize a competition, the Cybathlon, where teams are showing, showcasing their technology, teams comprised by developers and pilots who sit together, who work together to optimize the technology in order to win that races. In this one and a half hour session, you will hear several talks and experiences about the development of assistive technologies taking into account the user needs. The first talk will be given by Lucas Jäger. He will speak about Cybertron and user-centered design. His talk will be followed by another talk given by Jan Meyer, speaking about a survey he made by contacting many teams, asking questions, and he will present that survey on user-centered design at the Cybertron. Afterwards, we have invited two teams to present about their experience in the communication in the development of user-centered designs. First, there will be a talk given by Maria Fossati. She was a pilot of the Italian team Softhand Pro and she will present her insights in user-centered design. The second team is Team Varilek from Switzerland with Silvia Rona speaking about her experience as a team member of their team developing a powered exoskeleton. Finally, we will close with some remarks and I wish you a lot of fun. Enjoy this session. Dear audience, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to tell you how Cyberthon is a driver for user-centered design of assistive technology. At the same time, I will lay the foundation for the, my subsequent speakers who will present their insight from a team perspective. First off, I would like to start by introducing the project to you with a short video clip. Cybathlon is more than a competition. Cybathlon is emotion and innovation. It moves people and technology. Numerous teams from all over the world compete against and with each other with one common vision, a world without barriers. Around 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability and often face barriers in their daily life. And this despite of 175 countries which have committed to removing barriers, protecting people with disabilities against discrimination and promoting their inclusion and equality in society by signing the UN Disability Rights Convention. Assistive technologies can help people with disability overcome some of the challenges in their daily life. But unfortunately, the acquisition and use of such technologies are still difficult for various reasons. Sometimes research projects do not sufficiently consider the needs of the people concerned. Due to political factors, high production costs and prices, many people can't even afford assistive technologies. The inclusion of people with disabilities in everyday life is often limited for those reasons. Awakened by these observations, Professor Robert Rehner from ETH Zurich initiated the non-profit project Cybathlon in 2013. He believed competitions would be the best way to drive the development of new assistive technologies and to raise public awareness of the challenges people with disabilities encounter. The idea was well received by scientists as well as people with disabilities. 
but also the great response of the media and the public encouraged Professor Robert Rehner to develop his initiative further. Since then, many international competitions have been held. Broad attention is guaranteed when teams from all over the world present their many years of research and development in assistive technologies to a large audience on the Cybathlon platform. The competition is unique for the audience and especially for the participating teams. Teams are motivated to continuously improve their technologies and to bring research forward and thus push a sustainable improvement in the quality of life for people with disabilities. For a world without barriers. Through all its activities, Cyberflon aims to facilitate communication between its three main stakeholder groups. Those three, main, those three stakeholder groups are the general public, re, the group of research and development, and people with disabilities. Between people with disabilities and the general public, Cybertlon aims to promote the dialogue on the topic of inclusion. Between the general public and research and development, Cyberflon aims to communicate about the opportunities that modern assistive technologies provide, but also about their limitations. And lastly, between people with disabilities and research and development, Cyberflon wants to make sure that during the development, the needs of the end users of the technology are considered. The technologies that are developed are put to the test in the competitions. The competitive situation asks the teams to be ready on the spot. When the pilot and the technology are at the start line, their, their technology must function reliably, must be highly functional and it must be safe to yield high performance in the races. As a consequence, our concept is that the acceptance of the devices in daily use will also be higher. Uh, a further very critical aspect is that the technology or the competitions as actually represent actual daily life challenges which people with disabilities encounter in daily life. So, the device, so to make sure that the technology is highly functional. So for us, it is highly important to have an extensive exchange with the end users to be aware of their needs and expectations from the technology and at the same time to be in intense uh, exchange with the developers of the technology to know where the field and the developments are heading. Out of these insights, we create uh, the tasks uh, for the for the competition and uh, that that challenge and and promote the, in the improvements of the technology at the same time the tasks must be entertaining for the audience they must be accepted by the teams and safety must be assured at all times there are six disciplines that are part of the competition and each of the six disciplines has its own improvement potential and the challenges which people with disabilities in those six disciplines encounter are also different. So for example, in the powered arm prosthesis race, there are pilots with above wrist amputations who participate in six tasks that represent daily life challenges. The improvement in those devices is still huge. For example, the dexterity of the fingers of those prosthetic devices has by no means reached the dexterity and functionality which a human hand provides. When we look at the powered exoskeleton race, where pilots with complete paraplegia compete, the challenges are completely different and much more basic since this is a much younger field of research. So here the questions are more about 
overground gate kinematics, the device of the weight, or also aspects such as dual tasking. Over the course of the project, we have realized that there are effects that, we, that, that span much further than the pure engineering aspect. For example, the team leader of the, team, the powered wheelchair team from Keio University in Japan told us that the, being part of the Cyberthlon has been really an eye-opening experience for him. He is, by training, an aerospace engineer, so he usually uh, ponders over uh, robots to explore space, uh, Mars, Mars rovers and uh, devices in, in that area. And he told us that being part of, a cyber, of the Cyberthlon team and working with a pilot has been truly eye-opening. Not only because he, he now is aware of the, of the, the expectations and, and challenges that uh, uh, their pilot has with regards to the, to the technology that they develop, but on a much broader topic, so Cyberthlon also promotes inclusion beyond user-centered design. The Cyberthon journey has started in 2016 when we first met in, the, in a big ice hockey stadium in, in Zurich. 66 teams from more than 20 nations uh, came to Zurich to compete against each other. The event was very well received by the local audience, by the scientific community, by people with disabilities and also by the media. So the device, the, the project was decided to be continued and that another Cyberthlon event, a big competition, should take place in 2020. On the road to 2020, we have held over 100 events across the world involving different uh, audiences, we always also try to involve the teams so they, they can showcase their technology and their achievements, leading to the next main event in, which was planned for 2020. However, then there was the pandemic and we soon realized that the physical event would not be feasible in, in May of last year. However, we did not let this stop our movement. We knew how much time and resources and energy that all the teams across the world had invested up to this point, and we wanted to give them a platform to showcase their achievements. We developed a new format, which was called Cyberthlon 2020 Global Edition, and it truly was a global event. The teams participated from their home environment, so they put up the competition infrastructure, they competed in the races, they filmed the races, and they provided us with their footage, and we created uh, two four and a half hour broadcasts covering the races, but also the topics of inclusion. We had many background stories, um, and the, the event could be watched from all over the world. Here, a short highlights clip from the last edition.
So much about the concept of the Cyberthon and how we aim to drive user-centered design in the development of assistive technology. I would quickly like to introduce to you the subsequent speakers. There will be Team Soft Hand Pro and Team Varileg Enhanced. Both are part long-time participants of the Cyberthon and they will give you further insights on how they involve their end users to meet the, the needs and the expectations. Before doing so, I would like to introduce Jan Mayer from Relab at ETH Zurich, with whom we have conducted a survey amongst the Cyberthon 2020 Global Edition participants on their practice of user involvement in the design and development process. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much, Lukas, for the nice introduction. My name is Jan Thomas Meyer. I'm a PhD student at the Rehabilitation Engineering Laboratory of ETH Zurich. And today I'm very pleased to get the opportunity to talk about some of the insights we got from our survey investigating the use and design practices and effects within and among the participating teams at the Cybertron. To start off, I want to share my personal story how and why I became interested in advanced assistive technologies and more specifically in user-centered design. And this all starts with the Varilek team. The Varilek team already participated at the Cyberclone 2016 together with the pilots Vander and Philip. After the Cybertron, ETH Zurich wanted to continue the research on the variable impedance actuation of the Varilek. And to do so, longer studies were planned, and the pilots agreed to continue their involvement with the, with the project, but only if, for example, the physical attachment system was personalized and improved. So this was the project that I addressed within my master thesis. So in my master thesis, I looked at the existing physical attachment system of the body leg, and I put it on myself, but also ask other neurologically intact users to put it on to evaluate the comfort. But what was more important it was to involve Werner and Philip into this process to make sure that their user needs and their wishes are met. Together not only with them but also with clinical and orthopedic experts, we developed concepts, prototypes and eventually evaluated them. And we knew of course if the first Iteration, the first solutions were not yet optimal, so we reiterated the process and finally ended up with an improved physical attachment system. If you want to read more on that specific study, you can read up on the i publication of 2019. What's more important for today is that we learned a lot about user-centered design in this very first study. What we mainly learned was that user-centered design is easier said than done, so I started my PhD on the topic. User-centered design exists of different phases, starting from empathizing with the user problem, defining user needs and device requirements, ideating, prototyping, and eventually evaluating. Within these different phases, the pilot and the technical leads have to work together somehow to make sure that the user needs are met We know that the main challenges of user-centered design for people with special needs are active user involvement and thorough device evaluation. What this means specifically is that it's not that simple to understand and define real user problems if you cannot identify yourself with them. You have to make sure you, for example, understand how an amputee goes through his life or how a person with paraplegia wants to increase his mobility. For that, you need to identify and integrate all relevant technology stakeholders. And eventually, you have to critically review your solutions. But how do you do that if there is no benchmark or no previous experience available? So these challenges are what I try to address within my PhD. And to start off, I wondered what better platform to investigate user-centered design practices than the Cybertron. The Cybertron 
offers a perfect platform to investigate current advances in technology development practice. More specifically, its concept, as Lucas already explained to you before, and specifically its concept goals, really resemble the mindset and workflow of user-centered design. That's why we decided to challenge the promises of the Cybertron by specifically investigating the individual concept goals. In terms of considering needs, we can ask if the pilots are actively involved and considered during device development. To identify chance and limitations, we can understand and investigate if the devices used at the Cybertron are also usable in daily life, and if not, what the barriers and limitations are. And of course, we want to understand to what extent the platform does not, not only promotes research and development, but also acceptance and inclusion of people with disabilities. In order to investigate these questions, we designed an online survey with Question Pro. The Question Pro software allowed us to design a survey that was also compatible with desktop applications, smartphones, or tablets. We designed 26 questions for pilots and 30 for technical leads, whereas some were overlapping for comparison and others were more individual. Since not all of the pilots nor the technical leads spoke English well enough to understand the sometimes necessarily complex questions, we translated the survey to nine different languages. Data, well, the data was collected during the last two weeks prior to the Cybertron 2020 Global Edition. We contacted all teams participating in the disciplines EXO, Wheel, ARM, LAG and FES. Since for PCI, there was another study and another survey planned. We also contacted teams that had, forfeit, had to forfeit only days or weeks before the event. In order to collect the data eventually, we set up online meetings via Zoom together with the pilots and technical leads, and we created breakout sessions to minimize the interaction bias whenever possible. In some of the sessions, as for example, with Angel Robotics, this was not possible since anyways, all the participants were in the same room, so they just completed the survey on their own smartphones. We aimed to collect the data before the first heat recording, and it was necessary to record any of the data before result broadcasting. In total, we were able to collect 81 responses from 35 pilots and 46 technical leads. These responses came from 41 different teams, 36 of which were part of the Cyberlon 2020 Global Edition, which made about 80% of all the teams participating in the investigative disciplines. Also, five teams that had to forfeit participation were included into the study. Of course, we had varying sample sizes per discipline since also the number of teams within each discipline varied. Looking, for example, at the devices that the pilots described, which they used at the Cybertron, which range from devices building from scratch, devices based on existing previous or prototypes, or devices that are a modified commercial product, we can see that in total from 35 pilots, this was evenly distributed between, between the three characteristics. But we can also see that, for example, for younger disciplines, such as the exoskeleton, lower limb exoskeletons, around half of the devices were built from scratch, whereas in prosthetics, specifically in less prosthetics, we had more commercially modified commercial products. So now, look, coming back to the first question, uh, tackling the users and the design concepts of, of the Cybertron, we wanted to know, are the users and the pilots involved in device development. And we can say yes, in general, 85.7% of the pilots were actively involved in device development. 17.1% were even involved for more than four years. And if you look at reasons why some of the pilots were not involved, they were simply due to basically using a commercial product and, and hence was not, not being around for the development of it, not being around at that time, or not seeing themselves as a developer. Now, of course, um, being involved as a quality um, can be very greatly. So we also asked the pilots and the technical leads to what extent they thought subjectively uh, if, for example, their inputs uh, on the design were active and if they were considered. 
and if we look at these Likert scale questions, um, we can see that, for example, in a statement to the pilot or I, so to the pilots it was I gave active input on the design, the pilots do not fully agree with that statement so far, maybe because they didn't see all of their wishes integrated into design, maybe because they wanted to um, be involved more, or maybe because they underestimate the effect they had on the device. In terms of if the inputs were considered in the design, again, the technical leads were rather positive on the statement, whereas some of the pilots were rather critical. Now, in terms of if the pilot was sufficiently involved in device development, both groups agree to the same extent. So we can say the technical leads and pilots do not fully agree on the quality of pilot contribution, but on the quantity of doing so. Now we also can do an in-depth analysis of the individual phases. So to what extent the pilots and technical leads were involved in each individual phase, which is something that we will hopefully publish in the paper coming for that work soon. Now, a second important question identifying Jensen limitations was to understand if the devices used at the Cybertron are also usable in daily life. We can see that right now only 25% of the pilots really use their device in daily life, most of them coming from the powered arm prosthetic races. Some of the FES bikes um, were able uh, or are able to be used at home as exercise devices. For all of those who answered no, uh, we asked them to specify the factors preventing daily life usage. And here we were able to identify main adoption barriers, meaning that limited accessibility and non-availability really limit daily use. So you can see that 80% of the pilots simply don't use them because it's not yet available to them. Also, being too expensive or not compatible with the home environment are so-called adoption barriers. In terms of usability limitations, we see that limited comfort, inability to use the device independently, and overcomplicated use are among the main factors from a usability perspective. Now, in terms of promoting inclusion, we wanted to understand to what extent the platform not only promotes research development, but acceptance and inclusion likewise. And from a pilot's perspective, we can see that uh, almost 95% felt that more comfortable expressing their needs as an assistive technology user because of the Cybertron. Also, in terms of the Cybertron having a positive effect on social awareness and inclusion of people, a, lo a large number of pilots agree with the statements. So we can say the Cybertron does promote inclusion specifically by allowing the pilots to get a voice within research and development to express their needs and wishes within the user and design principles. We can conclude that judging from the participation, participating teams, the Cybertron appears to follow its conceptual goals and ideas. More specifically, user and design is a common practice among the participating teams. Uh, we also can identify the limited daily use and highlight usability and adoption use, uh, hurdles. And the platform appears to promote interaction as well as expression and visibility of special needs. In the future, we will continue to analyze data on user and design practice at and around Cybertron to investigate if pilot involvement, device usability and daily usage are indicators for performing well at the Cybertron to also drive forward advanced assistive technology benchmarking and to longitudinally assess the developments after the Cybertron, for example, towards translation or to another Cybertron. So at the end, I will also want to throw a few critical questions, a few critical points into the room that will be worth investigating. So the first point will be the sustainability factor of asking ourselves what happens with the pilots and the devices after the Cybertron. For example, do the pilots still get access to the devices if they don't really make their way towards, uh, for example, the market? If they won't get accessible as a product, um, can they still train in the devices and how is this financed? Also, of course, it would be interesting to understand how many devices and technologies 
eventually, eventually do make their way into daily life usage. And the other factor that we it's worth investigating is the competition factor. So to what extent are the devices already optimized for Cybertron because the race rules are quite clear um, rather than for daily use, which is a way more unstructured and unclear environment. Also, one interesting factor that we also tackled a bit with our survey is if the pilots are actually a representative sample of advanced statistic technology target groups, or once these devices actually make their way to maybe a broader target group, if the needs really change drastically. With those points open for discussion, I want to thank you for your attention and now I want to open the floor for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for these very interesting insights about user-centered design among the Cybertron teams. Dear audience, also very, very warm welcome from my side. Um, since Robert Riener is not available to moderate the session live today, I will take over at this part for the remainder of the session. Um, at the moment, we have not received questions from the audience, so I will start with a question from my side to Jan. Jan, you know the Cybertron quite well. You have had many different roles in the project um, when you were a student also. Um, what, was, what was the most surprising finding for you um, when, when looking at your results? Thanks for the question, Lucas, and, and thanks again for having me in this session. Um, yeah, so I think there were a couple of hypotheses or, or assumptions that we, we had going on when going into the survey, um, because we knew from the way the Cybertron is set up that the pilots somewhat have to be involved in the development. Uh, but I think it was still beautiful to see that 80% uh, of the pilots really feel to be an active uh, part of the development. I think that for sure was a positive surprise. Um, there, of course, we have some more insights into in which phases specifically um, of phases of development that the pilots are involved. And there actually a bit surprising was to see that only very few pilots are also part of uh, the prototyping and conceptualizing stage. And I think that is maybe an area where teams could still improve. Um, there are some teams that even employ the, the pilots uh, to be part of the research and development team to really be around every day. Of course, this is not possible for every single team, that's for sure. But there are ways to share prototypes or to share concepts with uh, end users as well. And I think this is maybe a part that can still be improved. Yeah. Yeah, so to make sure that they are involved in all the phases of, of the development process, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, in that regard, do you have maybe a tip or an idea how we as the Cybertron project could further um, motivate the teams to involve the end user at all stages of the development? Yeah, I mean, that's... I think that's a really tricky question uh, that really, again, is a bit uh, depending on the team structure, the team resources as well. I think one way that can be promoted is maybe to do some sort of workshops and maybe even organize a kind of Cybertron uh, workshops where you ideate on how to overcome an obstacle or how to, over how to tackle a task. Maybe that would be an idea uh, in this and in these workshops, you would have uh, of course, end users, but also some engineers or, or people that, that are from the hardware side and just to interact with each other and, and help maybe each other in how to get the ideas and wishes from the pilots to the actual functional prototype. And because that was also a bit um, one of the steps that we saw is could still be improved. So actually really following the wishes of, of end users. Um, but of, of course, on the other hand, um, I think the number of users that are involved is also uh, always relevant. Um, if you have only have one pilot that you really focus on, this is definitely like user-centered and it's single subject-centered. But um, in our experience in the very early Varilek days, we actually had two main pilots and two other so expert subject matter experts that were also somewhat linked to the project. And they also gave some input 
So not necessarily that all of them have to be pilots, but the target user base that you work with could could even be a bit bigger, right? Yeah, to have many to, to have more different perspectives um, in the development process. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, we have also received uh, questions regarding the Cyberflon. Um, the first one being if the Cyberflon will continue. Um, yes, the Cyberflon will continue. Um, we have we have uh, received the, the green light from from ETH to continue the project at least until 2024. Um, where we will have another big event, um, and on the on the road to 2024, as we call it, we will have several um, sub projects and activities um, to to pursue the the aims of the Cyberthon. Um, and then there is also another question: um, if we have already new ideas about the format. Um, yes, uh, we are very intensively discussing internally. And which would be the ideal format? Um, I think many people wish to have um, a physical, a physical event again, where, where people can meet physically and interact. But we also did see a few um, advantages of the of the decentralized format, and we are currently developing developing concepts of how we can bring the best of both worlds together. Um, I think in terms of time, uh, we will continue with the next um, contribution, which is um, by Team Soft and Pro, a team who has participated uh, several times already, and they will give you insights in how they collaborate as a team in their participation at the Cyberthlon. Enjoy. Enjoy. The soft hand pro is an anthropomorphic uh, artificial hand that is uh, used for prosthetic application. Uh, the, the hand was developed by IIT and in collaboration with the University of, uh, of Pisa. And uh, behind the, this work, uh, be, behind this hand, there are uh, technologies and studies that come from uh, both the robotic and technological side and uh, neuroscience. Indeed, two of the main aspects of these, uh, of these artificial hands are the use of uh, soft robotic technologies. This means that the hands have fingers and ligaments that are based on uh, elastic joints that uh, resemble and mimic in some way the, the, the structure of the human joints. And uh, the principle that uh, is behind the actuation of the hand, the movement of the hands, is inspired by studies uh, in uh, by neuroscientific studies that explain on how the human brain in some way control the complexity and the organization of the fingers of the human hands. Uh, with this, thanks to these uh, technologies and uh, investigations, we come up with a hands that is uh, simple. Uh, in the actuation, indeed the, the hands have just one motor, but uh, have uh, the complete architecture of the human hands, so basically have uh, 19 degrees of freedom, exactly like uh, the, 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 human, uh, the human hand. And uh, the hand, another characteristic is that it is uh, extremely robust. This uh, means that it can interact with the world, with the environment, without breaking and without damaging the environment or other people. And uh, can uh, be controlled in a simple way by, by users. Uh, our experience in, uh, in Cybertron started in uh, the 2016 when we participated with, uh, at the first session of the, of the Cybertron and uh, with um, a first release of the prosthetic hand that was uh, controlled by a body power mechanism. Uh, after we uh, followed, uh, followed all the development of, uh, the, of all the path that uh, bring to us to the Tyson to, to, to the Cybertron 2020, uh, where we participated with uh, a new team and a new release of the Softend Pro that is uh, totally myoelectric. Our team is composed by engineers in the field of uh, mechatronics, uh, computer science, uh, and, um, and electronics, uh, by a designer 
that, uh, is, uh, that is also our pilot. And, uh, uh, the, and uh, around this uh, core, uh, core team there are many other people that uh, work uh, on uh, experiments, testing and uh, developing adaptation of the, of, of the prosthetic device for, um, for the competition. Uh, behind, the, um, the, behind the development of the Softend Pro, there are uh, several funding projects that, uh, that comes from the European community and also from uh, private, uh, private funding. And uh, just to name a few, the most important are the Soft Pro project and the Natural Bionics project that uh, is, a year, is, a, is an ERC project that is uh, currently running uh, in, um, in IIT. The soft hand, thanks to its main feature, the adaptability, allow the user to maintain um, natural behavior and a natural approach in interact with the environment. That means on the first trainings, we asked to Maria just to try to solve some tasks without uh, further suggestion. And uh, we, through observing her and uh, listening to her suggestions, we redesigned the hand around her needs, around the user needs. When the work on the soft hand was finished, we, the real training began. And as training, I mean not only a physical training, but also a psych psychological training. That means we not only repeat uh, hundreds of times the task of Cybertron to speed up and refine every step, but also we conduct some stress tests to simulate the stress mood of a real race. Such as all race, the pilot's mood, um, it's very important on the final performance. I am Maria, the pilot of the Soft and Pro team who took part in the Cybertron 2020 Global Edition and uh, we really used a user-centered approach in training for all the tasks. Um, the first uh, task, the breakfast one, was uh, really natural for me because there were no blue objects. This means that I could use both hands, so like in real life, and so I really showed to the rest of the team how I usually do things at home and was really like performing a real breakfast uh, at home. So in training the clean sweep task, we really try every day to have a safe task, a safe modality to grasp the objects, different little objects, and um, to feel comfortable also in doing it. And we made it, we really do it fast and in a safe way. And I want to make a third example about our user center approach and was about the stacking, the last task. So about the, uh, this uh, pyramid made of um, glasses. So for us it was really hard and we really trying a lot to compensate all the movement that the prosthetic end could not perform. This means that uh, we had no an active wrist, so we had no pronosupination of the end. We have it uh, actually, but it's a passive movement. And so it was really hard for us uh, to perform all this, um, this um, compensatory movement with the body. And we took it as a sort of uh, dance in training to really have at the end a really smooth movement.
Uh, some of the tasks of the race are challenging to us. Uh, those are uh, very important for us because they also show where the directions of our next research has have to be. Uh, for instance, the uh, contemporaneous and simultaneous control of uh, motions of the hand with the wrist in some in operations is um, uh, difficult operations to realize with uh, a smooth, seamless interface to the, to the user. Uh, a second point is the use of grasp that also involves the palmar arch of the hand that uh, um, is needed in some cases. And finally, of course, is the rendition of tactile feedback from the hand to the user. These are directions of future research that we are going to implement next time. Behind the development of the Softend Pro, there are not just engineers, but also users that have a fundamental role in the developing of the Softend. Indeed, during the last years, we did many uh, experimental activities with, uh, with the users, with the end users. And this for us was a big opportunity to validate our ideas, but also to improve them and to uh, put inside the project new, uh, new concept and new uh, features of the hand. Example of this, uh, of this interaction, continuous interaction with, uh, with, uh, with the users is the um, developing of the control strategy of the hand, but also the developing of uh, uh, the features, the, the, um, the glove and the external features of the, of the hand. In this way, we were, we, have, we were capable to have a cosmetic glove that mimic the texture of, uh, of the human skin, but also to have gloves that are more, uh, that are, uh, more aesthetic and uh, more functional in some way in during the interaction with, uh, with the environment and uh, with, other, uh, with other people. Another important aspect that we found really interesting in interaction with, uh, with, the, per with the people, with the uh, final users, was that we understand and discover the new functionalities of the hand. First of all, we uh, understood that thanks to the softness, the hand is uh, um, is capable to interact with other people, but is also a useful tool to interact with the own body of the, of the user. This means that uh, people that use this kind of hands are capable to touch their face or touch their, uh, or, or touch their hand, the other hands or their body. And this, uh, we think that is really a backdoor to uh, improve the embodiment of uh, an artificial device inside the body schema of uh, end users. Thank you very much for this um, very uh, interesting video. I think it very nicely gives the different perspectives and also specialties that are required uh, within a team to participate and uh, successfully at the Cyberthlon. We now have several members of the team with us in the, in the, in the conference. Um, those people are Maria Fossati, who is a, um, a designer and also the pilot of the team. And we have Patricia Capsi Morales and Manuel Barbarossa, who are um, on the technical side of the, of the development team. Um, I will start with the first questions um, from myself, um, and I leave it to you um, who will uh, answer it. Um, user feedback was very strongly um, included in your development, as we have seen in the video. I would be interested in how particularly um, you integrate the feedback from the users into this process. So for example, how do the test sessions or the, the discussions that you have look like in practice? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And I ask uh, Patricia to answer this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, indeed, uh, for us, the user feedback was fundamental for the, for the training sessions, but also for the development of the hand. So as you have seen, our hand is softness is uh, soft, 
and, uh, and so it means that it uh, modifies the grass pattern depending on the contact with the objects. So for this reason, for us, it's very important to try in several types of approaches to the different objects that are included in the race. And we uh, use, a, like we spend a lot of time with Maria training the, the different approaches of the objects and the tasks that were included to see which one was better, like faster, more comfortable for Maria and easier to, to do it. So yeah, definitely for us, it was a very, very strong part of our work during the training sessions for the Cybathlon. Thank you very much, Patricia. Maybe um, Maria, what is do, do you perceive it the, the same the same way as as the the technical part of your team? Yes, yes, I remember really hours of discussion about how to do a specific task, because uh, from the user point of view, it's a bit different because also you feel the the all the whole body fatigue, so you don't feel maybe more. Mm, comfortable in such position, body with the somebody position. And so we had really long, long discussion in searching the best way of uh, grasping different objects uh, and achieve our goal, um, listening to the user specific indication and also um, embody with them with the real embodiment of the hand possibilities and capabilities okay i mean in the meantime we have received questions from the audience um, i will um, read out the first one to you uh, thank you for this great presentation great product um, have you had problems with phantom limb pain this question i guess goes to you maria Yes, I know I never experienced a uh, phantom limb pain because I was simply born like this with a um, congenital limb loss. So no, I never experienced that. Okay, um, the next question um, by Manfred Husti. Very nice presentation, congratulations. Can you tell us something about the wrist mechanism? Okay. Uh, maybe Manuel about the wrist mechanism. I can say something about the wrist mechanism. Mechanism about uh, strictly about the mechanical side, but I think maybe Patricia can add something more on the uh, on the using side because I know that Patricia worked a lot about wrist. And uh, for now we are for the for the race we decide to use the uh, passive wrist. Because uh, for the, the, the needs of the of the race, we need to make also the device really simple. But we had also a possibility to use uh, some uh, um, not passive wrists, so active wrists that can control by by Maria with the brain with the with his, her muscles. And so, if Patricia want to add something, yeah. Um... So yeah, as Manuel said, we were for, we we went for the passive wrist also because it was the the idea that we had for the previous cybathlon before it was um, uh, done virtual. Um, then we realized that we had some problems in the last task in the uh, pyramid. So actually, in that task, maybe it would be possible or good option to include an active rotational wrist. But we decided to go for the passive one because of simplicity in terms of control, because it's not only the, the implementation of the system on the, in, in the arm of Maria, but also the way to control it, which is very important. And we didn't want to, to add complexity in, Maria, in Maria's race. But actually, for the research area, we also are working in different type of race that uh, may include different degrees of freedom and maybe uh, control also the stiffness. So we have like different people working in different type of devices for the future options. And that maybe may be interesting for future occasions in Cyberlon. We don't know yet. <laughs> so if I understood you correctly, Patricia, you mainly um, for um, left out the active risk for simplicity reasons, not to have a sort of a um, an overload or a too complicated system for Maria when she is in the competition situation. Yeah, because of the stress. So it was not about the implementation of the of the system because mm -hmm. we were completely capable and it would be easy even uh, to 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 put a rotational one only pronosupination. 
but uh, we consider that for the control part it would be difficult because of the stress so the sweating so and we know that the, the my electric control with only two uh, sen two amg sensors sometimes can fail and also if you do like uh, compensatory movements can also lose the contact so we consider that it would be better to just focus with the passive and focus on the complete race and perform all the tasks properly Okay, so this is this is basically a, a situation in which you consider the the competition situation um, stronger or gave that more priority than the the actual daily use. Yeah. Uh, sort of. Yeah. yeah, because at the end, what uh, it's more important for the competition was the the execution of the task and the timing. Maybe for yeah. another condition, like maybe in the house of Maria, it would be feasible to to add this complexity because no one, like she's not in a like she's not like uh, running. But here it would be it's complex to to add complexity in the control part for yeah. full phase AMG, I think. And and do you already have uh, maybe a concept or uh, some ideas on how you would like to integrate this pronosupination, so additional situations? Um, while reducing the complexity of the of the use of the device how you can make it more intuitive or or that the device detects the intention of the user itself so what are I, your I, thoughts I on this answer to this because we already had some trial maybe if you want well yes but i think uh, patrice okay also for you because yes we are looking for uh, some researches that really help in control the, the more complexity of the end and of the wrist. Because uh, often I feel really difficult to switch in the state of the art of the control of the end. Well, switching from the grasping, the end grasping uh, to the wrist uh, rotation, um, it's achieved with the co-contraction of muscles. And it's really, uh, it could be really difficult and hard if you are in a stressed situation like in a competition. And also as said by Patricia, if you move the arm so you can lose the contact with the sensors. So yes, I think that the, in future, the research will be uh, driven also by this um, control issues. Okay, and we as the as the competition organizers will make sure that that we can we can test those additional functions uh, in the future. <laughs> let's, <Yeah. laughs> let's let's wait what the new rulebook that we are currently developing will will bring in that regard. <laughs> um, I have another question from my side to you, Maria, specifically as um, you are both a pilot but also a, a designer and a part of the development team. Um, where do you see that the pros and cons of having a dual role? Is, it main, is this mainly beneficial or does it sometimes also hinder the process? It's difficult for me sometimes because on the pros side, uh, it's great to, to um, provide design suggestion, being also the user. In a human-centered design, being the designer and the user, it's a win-win situation. And, but since uh, the designer really have to design for all or for uh, the most people possible, sometimes it's really hard to change my point of view from my side to the all people that could use an upper limb prosthesis. So in this case, it's a bit uh, difficult. And also being in the team, sometimes it's uh, hard because you never know <laughs> if it's speaking or talking the designer or the user. So it's uh, sometimes is uh, challenging. Yeah, to keep the to keep the perspectives apart and take the best basically out of both both roles that you have. Yeah, I see. Okay. So we have not received any further questions um, from the from the audience so far. Um, I suggest uh, with this we, we come to a conclusion of this um, of this live part uh, with you, Soft Hand Pro. I would like to thank you very much for your for taking the time and for joining this session from from Italy. Um, and I wish you all the best and hope to see you again uh, at one of the upcoming events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions.
Uh, we will now come to the last talk of this session given by Silvia Rono, who is a long-standing member of the enhanced teams at, at OST um, uh, University for Applied Sciences. Um, and in her talk, she will give um, her perspective from, uh, from participating in several um, of the past events and also give an outlook on, on their ideas of future assistive technology for people with disabilities. Enjoy. Thank you for the opportunity to give you some insights about our way to the Cybertron 2024. I am Silvia from the OST, the University of Applied Sciences of Eastern Switzerland. We are hosting two teams who participated in several Cybertron activities so far, including the Cybertron 2016 and the Cybertron 2020. I will start with a short retrospective of what happened last year uh, with our two teams. And then I will also give you some perspective on what our plans are and what will most likely happen on our way to Cybertron 2024. Let me introduce you first to the team Wavilek Enhanced. This team was built in 2018 as a collaboration of ETH Zurich and OST. ETH Zurich participated in the Cybertron 2016 already with the team Wavilek in the exoskeleton race. This was great. They did have a huge lot of experience already in building exoskeletons which were fully functional, and they decided to team up with us so that we could make their devices a little more robust and a little quicker. We started with a team of 15 students from both schools uh, and from various disciplines and backgrounds. And this team was able to build a completely novel exoskeleton from scratch within 10 months of intense work. In general, this exoskeleton was working well enough to complete the whole obstacle course for Cyberflow 2020. And they handed over this technology and knowledge to us in 2019. The plan was that we could iterate a bit on mainly on the robustness of the technology and then have a very, very intense training phase with our two pilots. Due to the pandemic, of course, since the Cyberclone 2020 was postponed, this training phase was on one hand disturbed and interrupted, and on the other hand prolonged for us. Um, overall, this made it possible for us to have two pilots starting in the Cyberclone 2020 with Team Varileg Enhanced. Those two pilots were Thomas Krieg and Rolf Schoch. Thomas is a wheelchair user um, with a complete par paralysis due to a bobsled accident. He's paralyzed sub TH12, which means that he does not have any function in the leg. He does neither have motor nor sensory function in the leg, but he does have some residual function in the abdominal muscles. In his everyday life, he's working as a site agent on construction sites. The other pilot in the team is Rolf. He's normally working in a truck garage and his paralysis is a little lower, which a little higher, which means that he does not have any residual function in the abdominal muscles. I will give you the opportunity to have a, have a quick insight in how our device worked and our team also in the video on the next slide. Go Wolf, go enhanced! Das ist eine komplette Querschnittlähmung ab dem Brustwirbel TH5. Ich bin mit dem Motocross umgekehrt, am Rennen. Ich begeistere Technik eigentlich und Sport allgemein. Und ich bin froh, wieder mal so etwas machen zu können. Der kennt die Maschine auch sehr gut und das finde ich ist auch eine Qualität für einen, für einen Piloten. Wir wollten leichter werden, wir wollten mehr Leistung in den Antrieben haben. Das zeichnet uns aus. 
spüre schon, dass das Team für das lebt jetzt im Moment. Es ist schon viel Herzblut dahinter. Well, our two pilots, Thomas and Rolf, both participated in the Cybertron 2020. They were ranked on rank 6 and rank 7 with exactly the same time, which means for us that probably not the pilots for the bottleneck, but rather the machine we built. Um, and we're pretty proud that we were able to bring, with a lot of training, to bring both pilots to an equal level. The second team, which started at the Cybertron 2020 in terms of enhanced teams, was Team HSR Enhanced. Team HSR Enhanced participated in the Powered Wheelchair Race already in the Cybertron 2016 and also in the Cybertron 2020. For both big races, our pilot was Florian Hauser, and he's a quadriplegic wheelchair user, he's paralyzed sub C5, which means that he does not have any trunk control. Uh, he does have only partial arm control and basically his arm control is limited to the shoulders. He does have some little elbow function, but he does not have any hand function, for example. And in his everyday life, he's also working as a side agent for on construction sites like Thomas. Um, you can enjoy the video with some um, impressions on how his wheelchair and Florian himself work. Cybertron 2016 was very exciting and one of the biggest moments in my life and it is so cool and we win it in the end. Florian is one of the most experienced Cybertron pilots there is. And uh, you see that when he trains, he's, he's always very attentive. He knows his machine super well, and he also knows how to give feedbacks to the engineers such that they can make a better machine for him. It's a wheelchair for a tetraplegic person. Because of that, our pilot cannot look behind his back. This means that the wheelchair has to be able to attack all obstacles in forward mode. We have been preparing for the Cybertron basically since 2016. This is just a great moment for everybody because all the work now comes to a, to a conclusion and we see how well we did. So I'm nothing without the team, but I am all with the team. You might have noticed this video was taken before Cybertron 2020. Um, Florian did not know there um, that he would win again in 2020. So he won the gold medals uh, in both big Cybertron events plus some smaller Cybertron series events. Um, you might also have noticed that both teams, Varilek Enhanced and HSR Enhanced, are really, really close together. Um, so, when it came down to the Cybertron 2020, we tried to, um, to celebrate together, which was tricky because of the pandemic. Nevertheless, we were able to have a very small party with selected people, mainly of course our three pilots from both enhanced teams and the core development and training team at the time. Um, since it wasn't a big, big party, we were at least able to discuss a lot. And we discussed what we would do next, because all of our pilots are still very motivated and very strong parts of our teams. Um, we tried to answer already then what we would do next, and we decided that we, that we would shift our focus a little bit. Our new focus now lays on the patient benefit in the first phase, 
we would really like to apply technology we have developed and we will in the future also develop um, with a wider patient population. So far we had three users and we built basically race machines for them. Um, that is very good and very, very user-centered as well, but the impact is pretty small. Um, so we decided, hey, we want to open up our patient population and we also want to investigate on what kind of benefits could our mobility aids have in a wider population. Later, probably starting next year at some point, um, we will get go back to focusing on the sports aspect and also we would like to participate in a Cybertron 24 where we can go back to foster inclusion in general in the society. With this new focus we were able to formulate three new goals. Mainly that would be developing a mobility aid which is suitable for everyday use. That means that innovation for us should be, of course, focused on user needs, but it also has to take into consideration the market requirements. So we're really developing in terms of innovation with all its aspects. We would also like to make our novel mobility aid easily operable for users. Our current race machines are tailored to the needs of our pilots, which is good. Generally, the user interfaces work for them. But even if I'm in the wheelchair of Florian, it's tricky for me to control it, even if I have much more arm function. But he does have all the training, he does have all the knowledge, and I'm way slower on the obstacle course than he is. So what we would like to achieve is to have a good user experience for all the users, which is not only on an obstacle course, but also in everyday use. As a third goal, we would also, of course, secure the success in the sports disciplines at Cybertron. With these three goals in mind, we were able to start a new project. We call it Enhanced Hybrid. And we decided to develop strictly user-centered. You have heard about user-centered design already in Jan Meyer's talk. Um, basically, it's always similar. We do have four steps. We empathize with the users. We hypothesize how we could solve their problems. We build something and then we do test very early. And what you see here is basically the double diamond of design thinking as well. Um, these four steps are iterated in very small rounds, very quickly. And the first results of this type of user research we got so far is that perplegics like their wheelchairs in Switzerland. They, the wheelchair is in many situations their preferred solution, especially when it comes to traveling longer distances. They're even quicker than pedestrians and they are able to place some objects on their laps so they can transport stuff as well. But we also learned that in some situations paraplegics would prefer an exoskeleton. Um, for example, situations as cooking in the kitchen where you have to be upright and, and walk for a few steps where you have to stand close, closely to, to the staff and also when you have interaction with other people on eye level. So what do we do with these first user, set, user research results? It's pretty simple and straightforward. We would like to combine the advantages of wheelchairs and exoskeletons. Both technological approaches have their advantages and our users would like to choose which approach they use in their everyday lives. The current status of our project Enhanced Hybrid is um, that we are still in the clarification phase. Uh, it's the phase which is most interesting to us because we involve user groups in this very early phase. And by user groups, I'm talking patients, wheelchair users, all types of paraplegics, and quadriplegics 
but also about therapists and orthopedists who have close contacts to um, paraplegics. We have very quick and small iterations with user interviews and we confront our users with different ideas we might have, which we currently develop um, with the user feedback we get. We do strictly focus on user needs. All the engineers among us might have noticed from the sketches. It's not really technically feasible what is on there, um, but that's not the focus right now. That will be our problem later. We focus strictly on the user needs. We decided to keep up our intermittent development phases because that seemed to work pretty well uh, in HSR enhanced and in viral leg enhanced so far. Also here, we mainly apply student works for the novelties and for the proof of concepts. And we apply the more experienced lab stuff with research associates for the consolidation of this newly developed technology. In the end, I would like to say thank you uh, for listening. I would also like to thank all the users. I didn't put all the names up there, um, but certainly our three pilots, Thomas, Wolf and Florian. And I would also like to thank our collaborator, ETH Zurich, and our current biggest sponsor, which is Lemo. I would like you to get in touch with us if you're interested. Um, you can get in touch via our websites, or you can follow us on LinkedIn, or you can just drop me an email. I'm looking forward to hearing from you and also to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Silvia, for this overview of your past work and um, also providing your ideas for the future um, as, a, as a team. I would like to welcome you um, on the session now. and. Um, yeah, have, have, have a little chat and discuss with you the, the questions that come from the audience, um, which so far have, have not uh, arrived yet. So we'll, I will start with, with the first question from my side. Um, where do you experience the biggest challenges in working in, a, in an interdisciplinary team composed of engineers, composed of the end users, composed of human movement scientists who all have different perspectives? What, what's your experience? Um, good question, yeah. Um, actually, to be honest, my experience is that the challenges are not that huge. Um, that it, it might be that at the beginning, if you start with a completely new team, you have to translate back and forth a bit between the different languages. Um, terminology might be a bit different, but so far we had a really good experience with integrating very diverse teams with a lot of background diversity. That's, that's I'm very, very, very glad to hear. And I, I think this also shows in your, in your results and your performance in the, in the competition. And I can also feel there's a lot of enthusiasm and, and, and passion for the, for the project among your team members when I, when I meet them. Um, what do you think are, in your particular case, the success factors to have, to have mainly um, the, the positive effects from, from, or to foster those positive effects from the interdisciplinary teams? What, what we did in, in both big projects, HSR enhanced and Varilek enhanced so far, is that we basically started with the pilots. Florian Hausel was one of the very first team members. We were lucky enough to have him on the team like three weeks after our decision that we would form a team. He is the team, he is the core of the team, and we were able to build our wheelchair basically as an interface between him and the obstacle course. And that goal makes it very, very easy with Florian in the team and then also like different people in the team. It, it was never a huge problem to have this transdisciplinary approach. Another factor which might account for the success is also that my personal background is in human movement sciences and as well in engineering. Um, so I at least understand 
both words a little bit um, so I can translate back and forth. Yeah, and, and then I guess there was also a lot of a lot of openness from the different team members towards the other other perspectives, I assume. Right, yeah. And specifically for, for the research associates, it's always the biggest factor for us is the motivation. If they're motivated, then they will be able to contribute. Yeah. They, they develop in different directions during their time in the team, but um, so far everybody found their way. And we have, we have also heard from Jan, uh, his talk in the very beginning, that, that not in all uh, the teams, the pilots are involved at all the different stages um, of the development process. And then your, your episode would be a, a strong argument for including them as early as possible and as, um, as, as intensively or as, in as many different aspects as possible. I think that's the key, yes. Um, without the pilots, if, if you don't have this very clear goal why you develop such a device, that makes it very, very difficult to understand each other. And I mean, one of the episodes we, we had with Florian, it, it, was, it was brilliantly easy. Um, we were training for the Cybathlon 2020, and um, it's a place where Florian could only reach um, by elevator and then the elevator um, broke down during the training and he didn't have a chance to to escape from the place except for the wheelchair we built for him so that made it very very obvious and very simple um, it's just what it's needed uh, um, a wheelchair which can um, ascend the, the stairs yeah, the real so a he, real he life was able example. To, to go for lunch with us because of the wheelchair. Yeah, and this also shows how how assistive technology that is tailored to the end user's needs is is also um, drives also innovation, right? Uh, in a, not innovation, but inclusion of 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 those groups of people um, within the rest of the society. Absolutely, yeah. I mean that, that that's the, the biggest goal we have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would. Um, I have in, in the meantime, I've received a question from the from the audience. Um, the question being, have you reached a final design that combines the advantages of wheelchairs and exoskeletons? <laughs> That's a difficult one. Good, good question. No, we have not reached a final design yet, unfortunately. Um, but we only started like three months ago. Um, it, it would be weird if we had reached the final design already. We do have some ideas. Uh, we do have some favorites among the variants we built, um, but there are still currently eight different design approaches, different concepts in the um, in the selection. Um, our next step there is to to merge as, as many of them together as possible, and then choose for um, one way to go. But as I mentioned, it's always an iterative process. So a final design won't be reached probably until in two years or so. Yeah, but but with, with you having worked heavily in both fields, I think you're positioned ideally to find this, this um, perfect combination. <laughs> Not sure, I hope so. Yeah, but... yeah. We will try. We'll try. So, so I'm looking forward to, to see um, your, your future design. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Silvia. In terms um, of or considering the time, um, we have to unfortunately already come to an end of today's Cyberphone session. I hope um, that everyone has had has enjoyed the contributions and the discussions, uh, also gained some new insights. I would like to thank the um, the organizers very much for for inviting us and for including um, the Cyberthon in in Mesrop. And we will finish off the session with a few closing remarks by Robert Reno. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks for joining this session. I hope you liked the talks given by the Cybertron members, given by the teams who did participate at the last Cybertron in November 2020. The next event will come for sure already in three years, 2024. We will organize the Cybertron again in Switzerland. Furthermore, there will be many different events taking place 
before 2024 already, we will organize Cybertron sessions at conferences, at fairs. There will be booths, there will be uh, hands-on demos, there will be races, quite large events organized in single disciplines at different spots in the world with teams joining and showing the newest technologies. So please stay tuned. I hope to see you at one of the next Cybertron events.